It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur from the CBS Television News Staff and Associated Press Correspondent Francis W. Carpenter covering the United Nations. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Charles Malik, Ambassador from Lebanon to the United States. Dr. Malik, Lebanon is a country about the size of New Hampshire with a population of about two million, I guess. Could you tell us something about the role of Lebanon in the Middle East? Well, Mr. Lesseur, uh, I don't know whether it's really as big as New Hampshire, but it's a very small country. And as to its population, it's, it's not quite two million yet. Uh, it may be nearer a million and a half. But it's a small country, both in size and in population. Yet its importance in the Near East, and I dare say in the world at large, cannot be measured by either its size or its population. For it is a unique country in the Near East. It's a country that is half Christian and half Muslim. It's the only country like this in the Middle East, and in fact, in history, where you have these two religions meeting with each other on a basis of complete equality and mutual respect. The Christians in Lebanon participate in Western culture and Western spirituality to the full. The Muslims, who are very vigorous citizens in my country, they participate in Islam and in Eastern culture. So I should say the most important thing about Lebanon is that how these two outlooks, how East and West, meet together in freedom and in perfect mutual respect. The second thing about it is that everywhere, whether in the Arab League, to which we belong, or in the United Nations, or in any international gatherings, we try to play a moderating and mediating role. Because we believe that in the end, only such a policy is successful and worth pursuing. And finally, I will add one word, and that is about freedom. Lebanon is famous for its freedom in all of its phases. People can think what they like, they can express what they think, and they can, uh, they can live as they please. So I should say, as a moderating influence, as a place where East and, and West really meet and mingle in freedom, and as a place where freedom can flourish, Lebanon is really a unique little country in the world. Well, Dr. Malik, uh, could we follow that up a little bit? And can you tell me, is the Middle East itself stable and secure at the moment? Is it in a stable situation? Well, now, I, uh, I take it you mean by secure uh, whether it is in danger of external attack or of internal uh, eruptions. Is that what you mean? Yes, I'm thinking mostly of the internal situation. Uh, I don't think we need to worry about aggression at the moment from any quarter. But is there is a ferment in the Middle East, or are they politically stable and calm at the moment? Well, of course, there is calm and stability, but I think it's more apparent than real at mm -hmm. the present moment, because we still have terrific problems throughout that whole area. First of all, we have not yet uh, related ourselves uh, on any permanent basis with the outside world. Uh, it is still a question as to how we should be related to Europe, to America, or to the communist world. We are still uh, unrelated in any permanent manner uh, to any of these words. Uh, secondly, even our relations among ourselves have not been fully stabilized. So it is a question also what sort of order among the countries and peoples and nations in that area is going to emerge in the next few years. Well, Dr. Malik, do you think uh, at the moment that the question of French Morocco and France's relations with its protectorate is capable of settlement? Well, it is capable of settlement if the French are going to yield, yes. But I find it very difficult uh, for, the, for the French at the present moment with all their internal problems 
and their relations to the to the to the African protectorates mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, to to proceed with any great hope for an immediate uh, settlement of the problem. So I am rather pessimistic about the immediate outlook, but in the long run there must be a settlement because it is a problem capable of settlement if there is goodwill all around. Uh, Mr. Malik, uh, you're not only the uh, ambassador to the United States from your country, you're the ambassador to the United Nations from Lebanon, and as that ambassador, you're also entitled to a seat on the Security Council. Now, do you think that the problem of Trieste, which is coming up in the Security Council tomorrow, is capable of settlement there? Well, I marvel at, uh, at your desire to see every problem capable of settlement, and, <laughs> and immediately. I don't know. I know very little about Trieste. This thing has uh, come up all of a sudden to us in the Council. I'm going to study it this weekend. Again, there are great uh, difficulties there, but I'm not uh, as pessimistic in that problem as I am with regard to some of these other issues. So I think some kind of a modus vivendi will be worked out between Yugoslavia and Italy and the other interested parties. Uh, could I go back to Morocco? Uh, the Arabs in their contentions to the Security Council said that Morocco is a threat to international peace and security. Well now, sir, uh, taking for granted that you have argued that uh, from all the evidence of the case, does it really appear that Morocco is really a threat to the international peace? There's no war there, there's no <laughs> aggression anywhere. Well, I don't think the Security Council, Mr. Carpenter, should be seized only of those issues which deal with war or with real threat to security. The Charter says uh, any situation that is likely to produce international friction or international disputes. Now, certainly Morocco is producing lots of friction and lots of disputes That's among true. nations. And therefore, from that angle, it is certainly worthy of examination both by the Security Council and by the General Assembly. Well, Dr. Malik, you're not only a diplomat, you're also known as a philosopher. Could you tell us, do you believe that coexistence is really possible between the communist world and the free world? If you, if you want my most honest opinion, I'll tell it to you, although I am uh, seen in television now. I believe unless there is a radical, fundamental change of heart in Marxist practice and theory throughout the communist world, I honestly do not see how in the long run peaceful coexistence is possible. Do you, do you see any changes in the uh, Marxist philosophy now? I don't see any changes in the fundamental Marxist theory now. I, uh, I read whatever literature I can get uh, hold of, and I read certainly the pronouncements of the great masters, living and dead, and I think uh, it, it's still the same old Marxist doctrine. Well, there have been flutterings of the dove of peace since Stalin died. You think then that those are just flutterings, that the spirit of world domination is still there in the communists? Well, I read Marx and I read Lenin and I read Stalin rather carefully, as much of them as I could. And uh, I, I, I do not believe that these men honestly believe that there can be peace until they have communized the whole world. And that's what they say. I'm not saying that. They are, uh, it's they who first said it. And Dr. Malik, beside being a diplomat, you were also the chairman of the committee that wrote the Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948. Have you seen any progress in human rights since that declaration was first presented? Uh, in the United Nations, so far as developing uh, documents of, le of legal binding force is concerned, we have not made much progress during the last five years. But I can assure you that the influence of that humble declaration, which we proclaimed five years ago, has been most incalculable throughout the world. I would like to pay a tribute to you at this time because I watched you work during three long months of working that document out. And I think that uh, a, great, a great part of its uh, value is due to the ideas you contributed. You go around the country making speeches from time to time, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Could you tell us uh, what, in your opinion, is the current state of American opinion of the UN at this time? I frankly am a bit discouraged because I find people losing faith in the United Nations at the present moment. I, I, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think it's worth strengthening this world organization and make it the real instrument that it should be. 
but there is a real slump in the feeling of the American people about this matter. Now, Dr. Malik, do you feel that there's any relaxation in the world tensions at this time? Yes, there is some relaxation, but it may be very deceptive and we should be most careful not to allow it to lull us into premature letting down our guards. Well, Dr. Malik, may I ask you one final question? Could you tell us what the Arab nations really want from the United States? Well, I think they really want simple things, Mr. Lesser. They want justice, namely that they, do not fe that they do not feel at the present moment that they have been justly treated. They want freedom, namely wherever there is a problem, where their own liberties are at stake, they f want to feel that the United States would help them to achieve freedom. They want a sense of equality with the rest of the world so that people can respect them on the basis of equality. They do not feel that. And finally, they want closer cooperation among themselves. And they would hope that the United States and the other Western powers will not stand in the way of developing whatever natural, closer relations they can develop among themselves. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Charles Malik. We've been very glad to have you here tonight. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur of the CBS television news staff and Associated Press correspondent Francis W. Parker, Carpenter. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Charles Malik. Ambassador from Lebanon to the United States. <clears throat> to watchmakers of the old school, such as Longines, pride of workmanship is a traditional attribute of every detail of every operation. In truth, the smallest cog in a watch is just as important as the biggest wheel. Pride of workmanship made Longines the world's most honored watch. Honored at World's Fairs by 10 grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Honored at government observatories with countless prizes and citations for accuracy. Honored as official watch of leading sports and contest associations the world over. For you who have an appreciation of the fine and the beautiful, the pride of workmanship, so evident in every Longian watch, makes an irresistible appeal. And our particular message at this time is an important one. If you wish to buy and own, or proudly give a truly fine watch, you may select a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. And regardless of the price you pay for that Longines watch, it is made with that pride of workmanship which has made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Longines, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. History repeated, and you are there, Sundays on the CBS television network. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, 
Larry LeSeur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Eric Johnston, special emissary of the President to the Near East. Mr. Johnson, you've done so much work of national importance in the last 10 years under three administrations, I guess. I probably covered more of your press conferences than almost anyone else. Now you've just returned from the Middle East where you were the special emissary of the president. Can you tell us exactly what your mission was there? Yes, I went out to the Near East to present a program for the development of the Jordan Valley. Before the program was presented to the United Nations and perhaps summarily dismissed by the nations involved. The development of the Jordan Valley calls for the irrigation of 240,000 additional acres of land in this area for the development of 65,000 additional horsepower of electric energy. Under this program, the four nations involved in which the Jordan, which comprises the Jordan watershed, would agree upon the division of the waters of the Jordan. It would avoid future conflict between the countries involved. It would make this valley blossom such as it has never done before and probably would allay a great many of the fears and the bitternesses that exist in this whole area. Well, Mr. Johnston, weren't your negotiations made considerably more difficult by the flare-up of trouble on the Israeli-Jordan frontier at about the time you were mm -hmm. there? It certainly was made extremely difficult. As a matter of fact, the bitternesses and the hatreds are very difficult to describe here, and I think it would be difficult for us in America to understand them. Well, Mr. That, uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, Mr. Johnson, do you think it's possible to put up a TVA authority uh, for the Jordan River Valley without peace in the Middle East? Oh, I certainly do. As a matter of fact, I think if the people involved would agree upon a division of the waters of the Jordan watershed, that that in itself would avoid future conflict and inside the riparian rights of the river. It will inevitably lead to future conflict, and the President of the United States wants to avoid that. Well, did you make progress? Yes, I went out there merely to ask these nations to consider the program and to talk to a special presidential envoy when he returned. In each instance, the heads of the governments of the countries involved agreed to study the program to see if it fitted into their particular plans and schemes and to talk to a presidential envoy when he returns and the president's asked me to return. You're going to be that presidential envoy. I think I Mr. Am. Johnson, do you think that the Middle East can ever be turned back into that biblical land of milk and honey under such an electric project? Yes, it really can. As a matter of fact, in this whole area, during the, at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, there were about 57 million people who lived at a, in a standard of living which was the highest of the then known world. Today, there are about 16 or 17 million people living in the same area at one of the lowest standards in the now known world. And if we continued our technical assistance program in this area, and if the British and the French continued, continued their program, perhaps 400 years from now, we would restore this area to its productive capacity at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, Mr. Johnson, this gets us to uh, 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 something which has been a considerable preoccupation of yours for some time, which is point four. You're still chairman, are you not, of the yes. International Development Advisory Board, yes. the point four board? Yes. Uh, what do you think about the role of point four in the Middle East and in the world in general? Well, I think the role of technical assistance is one of the finest things that America has ever done, and I believe most of the people of America feel that and most of the people of the world. Technical assistance in its broadest scale tries to teach other areas of the world to help themselves. In other words, we provide technical assistance to people in the fields of agriculture, health, sanitation, education, so that they can help themselves to improve their lot. We in America don't realize how important uh, technical assistance from other countries is to us in the United States. For instance, during the last 50 years, we've imported thousands of plants from abroad that has increased the productive capacity of various of our agricultural products. And without these new strains from abroad that have resisted disease or resisted rust or have increased the productivity per acre, we would not be producing anywhere near the agricultural things in America that we are today. Mr. Johnson, each new administration seems to make a policy of rediscovering Latin America. It seems to me you were once chairman of the Inter-American Development Commission. What's the situation now south of the border? Uh, south of the border, uh, they've made a great deal of progress in uh, technical assistance. As a matter of fact, today, the nations of South America contribute about $4 for every dollar that we contribute. 
I think there is no program in Latin America that is more popular than uh, the technical assistance program. Milton Eisenhower testified to that in his recent report after his tour of uh, Latin America. Point four has, have made areas of South America that have grown unproductive through misuse, brought them back into productivity again. It has eliminated mal malarial areas and uh, yellow fever areas that existed in these countries. It has brought new and improved livestock strains and new imp improved seeds to the country. And technical assistance is really beloved by the people of South America. Mr. Well, Johnson, to go back to your power project, your water power project in the Middle East, do you think that the president's new offer of a pooling of atomic energy resources would make a great difference to the output of electrical power, say, in the Middle East and uh, Latin America? Well, it could in a great many areas, but probably not in the uh, Middle East because they have tremendous resources of gas and oil and you can develop electric power from gas and oil probably much cheaper than you can from anything that we know about uh, atomic energy today or nuclear fission. But in other areas of the world where there is little or no gas or oil or coal or hydroelectric energy, of course, it can do a great deal towards increasing the productivity by increasing the power facilities of those areas. Mr. Johnson, you were a uh a man who met budget problems as a businessman and also as the economic stabilizer right after the war. Uh, you had some ideas then about balancing the budget. Do you think it's possible to do so? I don't think it's possible in the next uh, year or so to balance the budget. No, I don't believe it's possible. I think when we want to balance the budget, we must decide in our own minds what are the things that we're going to do without. Because you can't balance the budget unless you can, are willing to cut out uh, services or mm -hmm. goods which we're purchasing. If, you do, if you're willing to do that, then I think you can balance the budget in the United States. You mean it would be a reduction of the standard of living in the country to balance not, the budget no, immediately? No, no, I don't necessarily mean a reduction in the standard of living. I mean that there are things which we enjoy, which our government pays for. And we're going to have to decide what are those things which we're going to eliminate. What about inflation, sir? The uh, standard of the cost of living index is creeping up. This administration promised to end inflation, and yet it seems to be coming around all over again. Oh, I think inflation is pretty much of a dead duck. I think it may fluctuate to one or two per tenths of one percent in the next year, but that's about all. I think inflation is pretty, pretty well checked. Well, these things don't stand still. Would we have deflation then, do you think? No, I doubt if we'll have much deflation either. Uh, first place, there are inflationary tendencies in the economy, such as an unbalanced budget. Furthermore, I doubt if you will find a reduction of wages, and I think it would be un undesirable to find a, uh, a reduction of wages. So it's probable that for the next 12 months at least, things will be pretty much in balance. Mr. Johnston, your distinguished career in uh, government has been involved uh, a great deal with our relations with other countries abroad, particularly our economic relations with them. Do you think that it's possible for this country to uh, exist independently, apart from other nations well, in the world? Of course, world? I do not. I think it would be utterly impossible for us to do so. Many of our strategic materials we get from abroad, many of them we do not have in this country. We're becoming more and more of a have-not nation. More and more of the raw materials we get from abroad and many of the skills we get from abroad. I think the, le the leadership of the world has been thrust into our hands. This scepter of world power, many of us don't know how to use and many of us don't want to use. But the fact is that it is here. We can't throw it away. And we are the leader of the world, irrespective of what we may think about it. We have to take the position of leadership and the responsibilities that go along with it. You mean so our own self-interest uh, involves the rest of the world? Well, uh, in, in what way? You said something about raw materials. Well, for instance, most of our cobalt comes from outside the United States. We find that all, all of our, practically all of our tin and nickel come from outside the United States. A good deal of our copper. We're getting iron ore now from outside of the United States many other raw materials that we find essential for any type of productivity. Mr. Johnson has been talking in the past outside. of a roving economic ambassador, and I think your name was mentioned in that connection. Do you think anything could be accomplished by having uh, economic ambassadors from the United States? Yes, I think a great deal can be done. The Economic Deve uh, Development Advisory Board that you mentioned a moment ago, of which I'm chairman, recommended to the President of the United States some time ago that there be economic roving ambassador to various areas. I think the job that Mr. Randall did in Turkey, as an illustration, is a remarkable job in which he talked to the Turkish people, told them changes that might be made in their legislation in order to attract foreign capital. 
Until today, Turkey has done those things. And today, we'll find that uh, Turkey is uh, one of the most profitable, can be one of the most profitable areas for private investment. As a final question, Mr. Johnson, you're on the television now, but you've been long associated with the motion picture industry. Can you tell us something about the situation in Hollywood now? Well, I think Hollywood's going through a great revolution. It's always been in a series of crises. It goes, uh, for, if it has a period of tranquility, it's kind of sandwiched in between crises. It's always been that way. But I think Hollywood will emerge better and finer than it's ever been before. Well, do you actually think that the uh, TV will not uh, put it out of business? Of course it won't put it out of business. Nor will the motion picture put TV out of business. They're both here to stay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson, for a very informative evening. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest was Eric Johnson, special emissary of the president to the Near East. Falling snow, carolers in the quaint costumes of the 1860s, remind us that this year, Longines, the world's most honored watch, will celebrate its 87th Christmas. It was the success of Longines watches in early World's Fair competitions, which started Longines on the road to world fame. As Longines watches won one grand prize after another, Great people the world over simply had to own this celebrated watch. The sultans of Turkey, the Mandarin of China, the Grand Dukes of Central Europe, and the millionaires of America. The Longines watches for this Christmas of 1953 are truly magnificent. Each is individually worthy of the awards and honors which Longines watches have won over the years. And each, through personal experience, will demonstrate the greater accuracy for which Longines watches have won prize after prize. And remember that you may still buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network. Time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur from the CBS Television News Staff, and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek Magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Herman Talmadge, Governor of Georgia. Governor Talmadge, the uh, economic situation, I guess, is just about the most important subject in the country these days. So I'd like to ask you, how is business down in Georgia? Well, on the whole, it's held up remarkably well, Larry, but uh, farm prices, as you know, have been going down for approximately 18 months. 
Georgia, with all of its great uh, industrial expansion, is still largely an agricultural state. And our farmers aren't faring too well at the moment. They're concerned because the farm prices have been going down about 18 months. Everything they buy has either been going up or remaining at high levels. So they have been caught in a price squeeze that's concerned them a great deal. Governor, uh, President Eisenhower uh, apparently was quite popular in your state in the last election. Has the economic slump uh, affected that? Well, the president was relatively popular, Ken. But you must remember that Georgia gave the Democratic Party uh, and the Democratic nominee, Governor Stevenson, the greatest uh, percentage-wise majority of any state in the Union. The l relatively large vote that President Eisenhower polled in Georgia was due largely to his personal popularity, the respect and the confidence that people had in President Eisenhower. And second, uh, there was a good many of them in Georgia dissatisfied with President Truman. Now, I would not think that the Republican Party in Georgia is anything like as popular as President Eisenhower. And if the elections for Congress were held at the present time, Republican candidates in Georgia would not poll half as many votes as President Eisenhower polled in the last presidential election. Well, Governor, who do you uh, Georgia Democrats feel as the head of the Democratic Party now? Is it... Uh Governor Adlai Stevenson well, of course, or we Harry Truman? We recognize uh, Governor Adlai Stevenson as the titular head of the Democratic Party since it was he who carried the Democratic standard in the last presidential election, 1952. But Georgians look to their United States senators, to their congressmen, and to their Democratic governor to form policy in our state rather than to the titular head of the National Democratic Party. Would you think that Senator Russell's name would be presented again at the next Democratic Convention as it was at the last? I don't know whether it will be presented again or not. I presume that fact would be determined by Senator Russell's wishes. If he desires to do so, certainly Georgians will support him as loyally in the next Democratic Convention as they have in the last two. Well, Governor, who do you Democrats feel controls the Democratic Party now, the Industrial North? or the uh, more conservative South? Well, I wouldn't say that either element entirely controls it. Now, prior to the uh, last day or two, the last convention, when they were passing the so-called Moody Resolution, the Democratic Convention in 52, it was pretty apparent that the left-wing elements of the industrial East were in the ascendancy of the party at that particular time. But before that Democratic Convention adjourned, Reason had reasserted itself somewhat, and some of those who had rammed through some of those stringent restrictions had to eat crow, and the Southerners and the Conservatives were in the ascendancy of the party and regained control prior to its convention, uh, prior to its adjournment. Well, speaking about that civil rights platform, the uh, Supreme Court is due to make a decision pretty soon, sir, on uh, segregation in the schools. Now, how do you... Georgians think that decision is going to go. Well, anticipating what the Supreme Court will do, all you can do, Larry, is follow legal precedents that have existed for a great number of years. Now, we know that the Supreme Court of the United States for the last 88 years has been making decisions relative to segregation in the common schools. Those decisions have all been the same. They've been written by Justice Brandeis, Chief Justice Hughes, William Howard Taft, Justice Stone, all of the legal giants of American jurisprudence. Without exception, they have held that the matter of segregation in the common schools of our state is a matter that addresses itself to each state and not to the federal government. Nowhere in the federal constitution is the word uh, schools or education or anything of that kind mentioned. The constitution hasn't changed. The laws have not changed. Sometimes the political complexion of a court does change. Sometimes it may be swayed by political pressures or sometimes by sociological opinions. But if they follow the law, as all lawyers understand it, they will uphold the present method, which is separate but equal schools 
and each state themselves may determine whether they want to maintain and preserve segregation or whether they want to change it. Governor, uh, assuming, however, that this decision does go against you, what plans have you? Well, we haven't made any particular plans as yet because we don't know what the decision will be, but we have tried to be forearmed. The General Assembly of Georgia authorized a study commission at its last session of the General Assembly that's composed of approximately 21 ladies and gentlemen of which I am chairman. A good many of the constitutional officers of the state government are ex officio members and I as chairman of the commission have appointed a number of outstanding leaders in all phases of activity in our state. We will study any decision of the Supreme Court and make recommendations to the General Assembly as to what court course of action it should follow. And then in addition to that, the last session of the General Assembly submitted a constitutional amendment to the people of our state for their approval or rejection, which will enable the General Assembly in its discretion and in its wisdom to utilize tax funds for the payment of tuition fees to private institutions if that becomes necessary. Well, that uh, is going to be a very difficult system to set up, I suppose. It's going to be very expensive, sir. Anything the Supreme Court does to thwart or change our present system of state control of our educational systems will be the most difficult thing that we in the southern states have had to approach or deal with since the war between the states. It will affect something like 12 million school children in about 17 states in the District of Columbia. Now, it's a Did tremendous number. Actually, 17 states have mandatory segregation. Four states have permissive segregation. But at one time, the overwhelming majority of the states in the Union had segregation. Now, the, pe the white people in the South and also the Negroes in the South want it left alone, just like it is. Governor, you agitators, white and colored, want to change it. Governor, this means, in effect, that your state would set up a private school system. I don't think there's any doubt but what my state would do so if they had to to maintain segregation. We intend to maintain separate schools in Georgia, one way or another, come what may. You, you, a lot of people that aren't familiar with it don't realize how far-reaching or deep-seated that is for both races, white and colored. Now, about the nearest comparison that I can possibly think of at the moment, if the Supreme Court of the United States suddenly handed down a decision that you could no longer worship your God in these United States as you saw fit, you can imagine the consternation, the chaos, the turmoil, the excitement that that would create. Any decision to outlaw segregation in the common schools in the southern states would amount to about the same thing in our area. Well, Governor, does that mean if you're going to may set up uh, private schools <coughs> and state funds that no matter how the decision goes, the Negroes are going to benefit through better schools and uh, actually, more advanced the, education? Actually, the Negroes are already benefiting through fine schools. In Georgia, the last several years, we've been building fine schools in the university system and in the common schools. We spend 53 cents out of every tax dollar collected in Georgia for public education. That is the highest percentage of any state in the Union. The next highest percentage is our sister state of South Carolina that spends 48 cents out of every dollar for common school education. We are in Georgia at the present time building 1,036 new school buildings in every county in the state for both white and colored students absolutely without any distinction whatsoever. It involves 12,000 new classrooms. It's the most gigantic construction program undertaken in the history of my state. Well, Governor, I know the local custom and tradition uh, are against racial mingling, but how do you think this whole problem is going to be solved in the future? Well, it'll have to be solved in the future just as it has been solved in the past by each state controlling state matters and the federal government handling federal problems and leaving local matters alone. Because if we are to set up a federal bureaucracy that tries to regulate the lives and social customs and feelings and one thing and another of all of its citizens, it will mean our Republican form of government as we know it today will be destroyed. The federal government... Uh, 
Next, we'll be having thought police and people to go around and examine you to see if you have any prejudices against red-headed people or blue-eyed people or freckle-faced people, and we find ourselves getting into the realm of the ridiculous when we try to deal with matters that aren't authorized by the federal constitution. Well, Governor, I'd like to ask you the final question, something about the uh, industrial situation in the South. Now, there's a lot of factories are moving down there from the North, and furthermore, a lot of new factories are opening up there. Do you think this is going to give the South a lot more uh, political power in the future? Well, I wouldn't say necessarily political power, Larry, but it will mean far more economic ability for our own local citizens. We're proud of the industrial progress that we have made in my state. Last year, Georgia received 270 new industries located in Georgia, and the increased payrolls of those industries in one year alone amount to between 40 and 50 millions of dollars. Now, lots of those industries were developed by local people with local capital. We don't offer any inducements to any industries to locate in Georgia. We want them to become citizens, help, them develop our, help us develop our state. We offer them no advantages whatsoever we don't give to other Georgia citizens. Well, thank you very much, Governor. I'm proud to have you here tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speaker. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Herman Talmadge, Governor of Georgia. Another baseball season is here. The major league teams begin their long grind toward a pennant and a chance for the World Series. And this year again, from opening game to World Series, Longine watches on the wrists of all National and American League umpires will officially time the baseball games. Now, timing the baseball games is an honor of which Longine is very proud because it reflects a trust in the accuracy and the dependability of Longine watches, gives practical proof of the superiority of Longine manufacture. Among the world's finest watches, only Longine has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now, in each of these magnificent watches, for you and for you, is the famed Longine watch movement, with greater accuracy and longer life inbuilt through superior workmanship. For an anniversary, a birthday, a graduation, for any important gift occasion. Throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longine, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur from the CBS television news staff, and August Hexer, chief editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Ernest A. Gross, former United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Assistant Secretary of State. From now on until next fall, when the United Nations Assembly meets and the congressional elections take place, this country will be faced by a continuing question. Can we keep Red China out of the United Nations? Now, our guest tonight has probably had more experience in fighting the battle of and against Red China's entry, and successfully, I may say, than any other man. 
Mr. Gross, we'd like to ask you, as our former ambassador to the United Nations, what do you think our present chances of keeping China out are at the moment? I feel very confident that uh, the Communist Chinese government will not win its seat in the United Nations, either in the General Assembly, when it uh, reconvenes, or in the Security Council. And I believe that uh, will be impossible because the great majority of the countries in the world, I think this applies to the Western European countries, to all of Latin America, now with uh, perhaps uh, no exceptions, uh, the uh, co British Commonwealth and uh, several countries in Asia and several countries in the Middle East will uh, oppose the Chinese Communist uh, representation in the United Nations. But Mr. Gross, uh, for example, in 1950, before Korea, was there any comparable uh, united sentiment against the admission? It was not nearly as strong. The, uh, in the Security Council in 1950, before Korea, the uh, Chinese Communists came very, very close indeed to uh, uh, winning a seat uh, on the Security Council. There is no doubt that uh, in the General Assembly there was strong sentiment uh, in favor of uh, seating the Chinese Communists. Well, Mr. Gross, are we against uh, Red China's entry in, in the UN because she's an aggressor now or because we hope someday to overthrow her revolutionary government? The problem of uh, representation of a member state such as China is a different problem than the one of admitting a state into membership in the United Nations. It seems like a technical difference, but under the Charter of the United Nations, it's a very important you distinction. Mean, you mean China is already a member of the United China Nations? China is already a member of the United Nations. The question is, who is to represent China? Now, China now has a representative. In the Security Council, the representative is Dr. T.F. Tsiang, who is a very able and distinguished, uh, one of the leaders of the, uh, uh, of the free world cause in the United Nations. He remains a representative, the representative of China, until he's replaced. In the General Assembly, the delegations of the nationalist Chinese government have uh, been very distinguished. Uh, they would be replaced by the communist Chinese if they won their seat. Well, Mr. Gross, when you were uh, our ambassador to the United Nations, you said that uh, the admission of uh, Red China to the United Nations or the ousting of nationalist China was not subject to the veto, but the present Secretary of State, Mr. Dulles, says it is subject to the veto. How do you explain that? In January of 1950, uh, on instructions from the government, I did uh, uh, announce that the position of the United States uh, government uh, was that we were opposed to the admission of Red China to the Security Council, but that we would accept a majority decision. You didn't say, therefore, that a veto was impossible. You said you didn't want to use the veto. Well, we, uh, we said that we would accept the decision. Actually, our position was based upon uh, a very simple and logical point. Uh, uh, the uh, fact of the matter is that um, the Charter of the United Nations provides that procedural questions in the Security Council are not subject to the veto. Uh, the uh, question of who represents a member state is, or has been regarded as a procedural question. And it's a very simple, there's a very simple common sense reason why, because you see, if a permanent member of the Security Council, one of the so-called Big Five, uh, had the right to veto uh, in the case of uh, who represented a government who was on the Security Council, then my good friend Dr. T.F. Tsiang, I hope he stays on the Council for a long, long time, but uh, Dr. Tsiang, the nationalist Chinese representative, could veto his own replacement because he represents China. China is a permanent member of the Security Council, and uh, therefore there would be no chance of his being replaced. That the question of the United States using its veto would never arise. The Chinese no, was, could use the it Chinese themselves. Chinese would probably use it themselves. Well, does this mean, Mr. Gross, that if uh, Guatemala's new government uh, were on the Security Council, that Russia would veto it? Well, that's an interesting point, because if uh, Guatemala were a member of the Security Council and the communists, the Soviets, did not like the new government, they would veto uh, the replacement of the representative of the former government of Guatemala. So there are very practical reasons, therefore, why we should rely upon the straight uh, majority principle and not get into the complications which would be caused by, uh, by the application of the veto, which I think is unnecessary in any event. Well, nevertheless, in the uh, assembly, uh, 
what sort of a vote will be needed there to keep Red China out? Well, will under the a, uh, uh, excuse me. majority of 31, a simple majority well, under or two-thirds? the charter uh, the, of the United Nations, it provides that uh, the, in the General Assembly, votes on important questions have to be taken by a two-thirds majority. And of how, do you vote, how do you how decide? decide yes, what is an important question? Well, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, procedure is that the majority of the members of the Assembly uh, decide whether or not it is important. If the majority decides it's uh, it is an important question, then it requires <coughs> a two-thirds vote to carry a proposition. I have no doubt that the problem of the representation of China would be regarded by a majority of the members as a, an important question and therefore would be subject to the two-thirds well, vote. Isn't all this discussion rather backwards? Wouldn't we first, wouldn't the vote come up on the ousting of Formosa of the nationalist Chinese government before Red China could be seated? Well, what happens in the General Assembly is that each time there's a session of the Assembly, uh, both rival candidates present their credentials, you see, so that the Credentials Committee, which is appointed each time the Assembly begins its session uh, once a year, uh, uh, that has to pass upon uh, which contestant, which competitor is entitled to uh, the seat for that government. Has Red China actually been doing that every... Red China uh, has been sending tele a telegraphic uh, communication. They've not been given visas to appear in person at the UN, UN headquarters, but they've been sending a cable uh, regularly and dutifully each time the General Assembly convenes and claiming the seat. Would you actually feel, or did you feel during your representation at the United Nations that, that Communist Russia actually wanted Red China to be a member of the UN. Well, I felt that while I was in the UN that uh, I could never read the mind of the Kremlin. Uh, I believe that uh, they have acted consistently as if they wanted the Red Chinese alongside them in the Security Council, and I believe that that's the case. I think it's kind of subtle to look for reasons Mr. why. Mr. Gross, um, are, there, um, are there conditions which uh, can be laid down and made clear to the world on which we would admit uh, Red China at some future time? Is there some pattern of behavior to which it would have to conform? Well, it's important uh, to try to define the uh, reasoning there. Of course, the, w our basic point must be that we should not support the admission of Red China to the UN unless, unless and until we consider it to be in our national interest to do so. Now, in the future, in the indefinite future, if we say that we shall never under any circumstances support Red China's admission to the UN, we are trying to outguess our own national interest. My own conviction is that uh, we should not support the admission of Red China to the United Nations until and unless we decide that our support of their admission to the UN is more likely to induce them to change their course of conduct and bring them into compliance with the standards of civilized behavior. Mr. Dulles has said that the UN is not a reformatory, so letting them into the UN would not reform them. They have to purge themselves first. The UN uh, is not a reformatory, I quite agree. I think it's more like a hospital. <laughs> it's supposed to reflect the state of the world, as Mr. Dulles pointed out in his very excellent book written in 1950, War or Peace. And it is, of course, a, supposed to be, by design, a fair reflection of the divisions and tensions of the world. I don't, not myself, draw much of a distinction between communist China and communist Russia so far as bad behavior is concerned. Well, do you think, uh, Mr. Gross, that if some sort of agreement is reached in Indochina, as seems possible from the news we've had recently, that uh, the chances of Red China's entry into the United Nations will be better? Well, I think that there'll be more pressure on the part of, um, uh, of uh, countries, uh, who some of whom are now, of course, uh, teetering on the edge of supporting communist China. Those countries which have recognized communist China, there are some 14 to 16, I'm not, I don't recall the exact number, uh, have not, uh, by and large, voted to admit Red China to the UN, to seat Red China. But it is true that uh, the closer the Chinese communists come in the future, if they come to compliance with the standards of international behavior, there will be pressures to seat them. Well, actually, if this pressure gets uh, very strong and it appears as, red, as though Red China will become a member of the United Nations, do you think we should withdraw? What would happen if the United States actually walked out of it? I just don't believe we will walk out of the United Nations. That would lead to a fragmentation of not of the United Nations, but of our national policy of solidifying the free world. We cannot possibly uh, um, break up the United Nations without reverting to the age-old balance of power 
a principle and practice which has inevitably led to war. We have to do what has been called uh, develop a community of power. I don't think the United Nations is really working as well as it should. I think that the Russians have obstructed it from the beginning. But we must, it seems to me, persevere in the effort uh, to solidify the free world. And we can only do it through collective action. Thank you very much, Mr. Groves. We appreciate having you here tonight. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and August Hexer. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Ernest A. Gross, former United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Assistant Secretary of State. <laughs> Big League Baseball is one of the many sports timed by Longines, the world's most honored watch. All umpires of both national and American leagues use Longines watches for timing all games, including the All-Star Game and the World Series. The fact is that Longines is official for timing championship sports events throughout the world. Official watch for the contest board of the American Automobile Association, the National Aeronautic Association, the American Powerboat Association, and many, many other leading sports and contest associations. Now, why is this so? The answer is Longines' great accuracy and complete dependability. The fact is that in some 75 years of accuracy competitions at government observatories, Longines watches have consistently maintained a place of honor, established many records, won countless prizes and awards. These are but some of the reasons why Longines is deservedly known as the world's most honored watch, the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of the world, and why discriminating people in 100 countries have found the name Longines the first word in buying a fine watch, the last word in accuracy, dependability, and complete satisfaction. And yet you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 7150. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Lecoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Lecoultre, division of Longines Whitnor. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur, and John B. Oakes from the editorial board of the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Her Excellency Claire Booth Luce, United States Ambassador to Italy. And President Eisenhower nominated Claire Booth Luce to be Ambassador to Italy two years ago. Some persons doubted the wisdom of his choice. Never before had a woman been named or assigned to a first class European power and certainly not to one that was in trouble where communism was growing. Well, two years have passed and communism has become weaker. Italy is stronger. Even the Trieste problem has been settled. In short, never underestimate the power of a woman. Madam Ambassador, or Mrs. Ambassador, before we catechize you, I'd like to ask you, just how do you like Italy? Are you enjoying yourself there? Well, Italy is a very wonderful country. I don't, I don't say that because I have the honor to be accredited to it. 
the proof of that is that uh, over six million tourists visited Italy last year, <coughs> 500,000 Americans, and they went there to see uh, the beauty of Italy and to uh, also to find that the Italians are the most charming and courteous people in the world. Well, actually, is Italy ready to stand on its own feet now, or do we have to continue aiding her? Well, let's face it. Italy is a relatively poor country. Uh, it will not be able to solve its own problems uh, entirely alone for a good many years. It will need the help of Europeans and others in the world, and especially of America. Mrs. Yes. Ms. Ambassador, uh, to what do you attribute the diminution of communist influence inside Italy, and how strong is it there still anyway? Well, I attribute uh, such a diminution as there have been largely to the common sense of the Italian people. Uh, they're a very wise people, and they are beginning to see that communism really, uh, really doesn't pay and doesn't produce the things that they expected uh, many of them of it. That is one of the main reasons. Also, the government uh, has taken some very uh, vigorous action against the communists in the last uh, year. You Such know. as? Well, they have uh, dispossessed uh, the communists from the former government-owned fascist properties, communist unions and uh, many communist organizations. They have moved in to clear communists out of sensitive places all through the government. Uh, they've done a good many things of that sort. They're invoking for the first time uh, very strong uh, libel uh, laws against the, um, against the communists for libel in the press. And Mrs. So Lewis, would you say that communism is actually still uh, Italy's biggest problem? Oh, there's no question but what uh, this encroaching form of totalitarianism <coughs> is the major political problem. How do you account for the fact that communism seems to have grown in the uh, agricultural areas, more backward areas in Sicily? Well, that's a bit of a paradox, you know. Uh, the government has really done some extraordinary <coughs> work in the question of land reform in the south of Italy, in the depressed areas. Uh, obviously, the government couldn't move forward to solve the whole question overnight, but very often where it has moved in, the communist organizations have moved in faster to take the credit uh, for what the government has done and to demand more than the government uh, can possibly do at this time without, uh, without risking inflation. Would you say that the land reform program really is progressing then in a practical and positive sense? Oh, yes, there's no question of it. I've seen those areas myself. Many, uh, many of our people have visited the land reform areas <coughs> and the government has done some splendid work. What about the question of taxes? A lot of people in this country think the Italians do not pay and never intend to pay taxes. Do you have any comment to make on that? Well, of course, millions of Italians do pay taxes because otherwise the government could never, never uh, <coughs> find the revenue with which to, uh, to keep its own uh, budget going. Uh, perhaps the upper classes don't pay taxes as heavily as we do. Uh, that's true. That's true all through Europe, as you know. I mean, Americans are the heaviest tax-paying people in the world. But also it's a fact. Uh, that more and more uh, rich Italians, well-to-do Italians, are paying more and more taxes than they've ever uh, paid before. And there's a lot of uh, tax reform going on, too. Mrs. Lewis, how stable is the government of Mario Shelba? What about all those scandals we've been hearing about here? Are they shaking them? Well, there were, of course, the, some very uh, severe scandals. There was the well-known Montesi case. Uh, then, recently, there's been uh, if a really startling scandal uh, called the Sochu scandal. It concerned uh, the really deplorable conduct, one wouldn't mention it, of course, uh, on the air of a communist called Sochu. I see. And uh, is Sochu still uh, in the Communist Party? Uh, no, he was promptly thrown out of the Communist Party when the scandal was revealed. Uh, Ms. Ambassador, what's the most important factor in American-Italian relations, as you see it after two years over there? Uh, economic aid, our military strength, the refugee program, what are the main 
problem. Well, American-Italian relations are fundamentally very sound. There's a long <coughs> history of friendship and understanding between Italy and the United States. I don't think that uh, there's any political power or any situation that I can conceive of uh, that would uh, really damage Italian-American relations badly. Obviously, the Italians do look to us as the world's strongest and richest and most friendly power for aid, and they've received an enormous amount in the past. Would you say American prestige is very high in Italy? Uh, well, Mr. Tarchiani, Ambassador Tarchiani, when he left, his post in Washington last month, called at the White House and told President uh, Eisenhower that in all the history of Italy, Italian-American relations had never been better. Due partly to our ambassador in Rome, no doubt? Well, that's kind of you to say so. Due if, if to the ambassador, let's say partly to the embassy. I've got a wonderful team of men over there. You what know. about Trieste? Well, uh, Trieste is a settled question, and the fact one hears so little about it now shows that it was a good solution that has been accepted by both the Italian and the Yugoslav uh, people. It goes to show you, you know, that you can avoid trouble and you can get things solved with patience and a spirit of mutual uh, sacrifice as the Italians and the Yugoslavs uh, showed in this very dangerous and troublesome question. Mr. Luce, uh, <coughs> diplomacy has been a male preserve most part of the time. Now, a lot of women are looking in at you tonight. Do you think there is a career in diplomacy for most women or for... Oh, I think there's a career in diplomacy for all able people who want to try uh, to, uh, to become diplomats, become foreign service officers, it isn't a question of whether they're men or women, it's a question of they're willing to work and if they're able. Well, you actually don't feel that there is a question of whether they're men or women. In other words, you feel that a woman can negotiate, can uh, maneuver with European politicians as well as a man can? Well, you want to know whether a woman can negotiate and maneuver? Yes. <laughs> I do ask <laughs> Mrs. Lasseur about that. <laughs> Do you think, uh, Mrs. Ambassador, that the Italians can make a really effective contribution to the Western European Union? And if they can, how? And what well, way? I think they've already made an, <coughs> a, a very extraordinary uh, contribution in the last few months. You do remember uh, that uh, they passed Western European Union with a majority of 120 votes. Uh, apart from the pro-common form parties, there wasn't a single vote cast against it uh, in the lower house, in the camera of the Italian parliament, and I think the Senate will pass it by the same overwhelming majority. There isn't any question where the vast majority of Italian people stand. They stand very firmly on our side. Well, we don't have anything to fear in the, in the next elections then? Mrs. Lewis? Well, no one knows when at this moment the next elections will be. They uh, are scheduled for 1958, every five years, as you know. They might <coughs> come before, so till one knows what the situation is at the time when they come, you, you can't predict. Mrs. Lewis, I was just recalling that the first time I met you was in 1940, up in the Maginot Line, when you were gathering uh, material for your book, Europe in the Spring. Now, as you go back to Europe, this spring, what will you face and find there? Well, certainly a, a Europe that has made an astonishing economic and I believe political recovery, but also you'll find in Europe in the spring that they will be very <coughs> concerned about what's going to happen in Asia in the winter. They will be deeply concerned that American arms, American prestige uh, shall have no setback in the Pacific because uh, a blow to American prestige there would have repercussions on European uh, politics. Do you think that uh, our allies in Europe are really firmly behind us in the event that we should get in trouble in the East? I think there's no question where the majority of Europeans want to stand. They want to stand within the framework of Western European and American civilization. They don't want war. Who does? 
I don't. I'm sure. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Ambassador. We're very grateful to have you here tonight. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and John B. Oakes. Our distinguished guest was Her Excellency Claire Booth Luce, United States Ambassador to Italy. They say everyone notices the watch on your wrist. To be well dressed, every detail must conform, including your watch. Now Longines makes a watch to fill every need, to suit every taste. And the choice of styles and of models is almost unlimited. For ladies, Longines creates superb examples of the jeweler's art. Exquisite in taste and finish, perfect for every occasion. For men, Longines produces watches for every requirement, watches for dress and sport. Longines automatic watches, the most advanced in the world. Waterproof and shock resistant watches for rugged service. Longines chronograph watches for sportsmen and scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique standards of excellence which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And this statement is true throughout the world. The Longines watch on your wrist is just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, the watch of highest reputation and prestige. Yet, surprisingly, you may own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. Help fight polio, give to the March of Dimes. <laughs>